नमस्ते निक वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन नाउ आई नो दैट यू ग्रो अप इन अ मिलिट्री फैमिली यू स्पोकन अबाउट दैट uh but in what ways did you either in your childhood or later in life first come across the idea of non violence well i think it was really when i was at university um and reading about gandhi uh i went to university and studied history um and uh and and gandhi there i, re- I read about gandhi when I mean, you mentioned a military family um i think all my father's family back to the early 19th century um were one way or another in the military um and uh, often serving in india in in various various parts and and so i was the first of a generation probably for 200 years which didn't wasn't in the army and for that i'm very grateful um and so the is the idea of of, of non violence came through i think reading sort of environmental writers um jonathan porrett in england uh, and so on and actually realizing the sort of i suppose the deeper roots of let's say modern environmentalism 20th century late 20th century english environmentalism and how that went back to gandhi so that was i think that's where it where it started that actually i suppose caring for the planet has a deeper root in 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 a in a philosophy of nonviolence i think and is there any specific link between your earlier interest in history and your full time engagement with the uh, efforts to reorient the market system and the investment uh, business to make it more sensitive to its social and environmental uh, impacts and violent impacts mostly uh, uh, do you want to talk about your interest in history as an entry point to that or is that a separate journey well it, it's partly partly a separate journey but i think in a sense um the way i so i suppose seen how you do you achieve nonviolence is through the the language of sustainable development so when i was doing my my masters degree in international relations um it was the time of the brundtland report grohal and brundtland uh who had this report on the commission on environment and development and came up with this theory of 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 sustainable development in the late 1980s um uh so really before the whole globalization wave started and i did my thesis on the theory of need in uh in 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 international relations and i think that's that sense of how we meet needs um not necessarily in a hierarchical way but how we meet needs together obviously basic needs for food and shelter but also for sort of spiritual expression and 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 fulfillment i suppose that has lain at the, at the roots of my my sort of professional career which has taken me into international policy um most recently into finance uh, partly because if you are in a capitalist system then i i reckon that it might make sense to understand and work within the capital within capital and and actually try to shift capital um so that's what led me to the um to to working in in finance um but what it was when i went into the the city of london um that actually my historical interests were reawakened let's say uh because i went to find the headquarters of the east india company and and wrote a book about uh, the east india company as a sort of mother of the modern corporations so i don't know if we want to touch on that yeah no no i i would like you to describe that in a bit more detail uh because a uh, um, today very few people in the west realize uh the violence with which the east india company conquered india uh but uh, even fewer still realize the connection between uh, uh well you've called it the corporation that changed the world not only because it gave britain uh, uh you know colonial might over so much of the world but because it did shape to some extent the current uh, corporation so maybe if you could first explain what was the significance of the east india company model and how then your work in the last 25 years has tried to counter uh, what today the corp- what the damage that even today the corporation can do potentially yeah yeah i mean, so so um 
I, I went into, I, I worked, as I say, in sustainable development for many years and went into the City of London to work in sustainable and responsible uh, investment, SRI as it's called, in December 2000. So this was, if, if those who have memories or know about sort of financial history, this was the dot-com boom and crash. So this was a time of sort of crashing markets and, and, and lots of scandals and so on. And actually, I had just been doing a lot of work on, uh, on the uh, garment and textile industry in Bangladesh. I, I'd come from that, that world and trying to ensure good labor standards and so on. And I can remember in a, in a, in a, in a, in a tea break, uh, talking to people in one of these workshops in Dhaka, about the East India Company, and, and people said Bengal has this glorious history of, of textiles and garments until the East India Company came along. And I said, well, who is this East India Company? I, I, I mean, I'm a historian, I maybe heard of it, but who is it? Oh, well, these are the people who chopped off our weaver's thumbs. And I thought, this is extraordinary. I mean, <laughs> I've never heard of this. This is a very terrible thing. So when I joined the City of London, I was there in the markets, thinking about how investment can encourage responsible companies. And I went to where the East India Company's headquarters was, which is the Lloyds Building, where the Lloyds Building is now in the city. And it just made me realize the sort of, I suppose, the, the, the depth um, of, of practice uh, between this historical corporation, the East India Company, and today's uh, corporations. Um, and I think what was very distinctive about British conquest of India, for example, is that it was led by a shareholder-owned corporation. It wasn't engineered by the state. There was no state plan for this. Yeah? It was engineered by uh, a corporation, and it was done uh, in a way to promote the interests of that corporation, so shareholder returns and the interests of, of, it, of its management. So, so when I came into the City of London to work on SRI, I'd just actually been working previously on uh, the garment trade and fair, fair trade and labor standards, particularly in Dhaka and in, in Bangladesh. Um, and I can remember in a tea break, actually, after discuss discussing how you have bring dignity and justice to particularly the, the women workers in Dhaka and the garment trade. Um, Talking about the East India Company, because that had come up as in, in some of the background, the glorious history that Bengal had in terms of textiles and garments and so on, um, until the East India Company came along. So I, I was asking people, these were, these were garment people, not, not academics, well, who is this East India Company? What was it? And, and they were saying, well, this was the corporation that chopped off our weaver's thumbs. And that was really striking. It's a terrible idea. Very, you can imagine the pain, actually. It's, it's a very pain, you could because it's your hand, you can imagine it. So that struck me. And again, I, having a historical background, I'd heard of the East India Company, but didn't really know much uh, about it. And I think particularly in England, there was a very sort of romantic view about it. That here was a company who maybe had brought all these lovely, sensuous things, spices and textiles and silks and so on. So when I went to the city of London, I tracked down its head, where its headquarters was, because this was a shareholder-owned company. Its headquarters was in Leadenhall Street, um, which is where the Lloyd's Insurance Building, which you might know, a very sort of glamorous uh, building designed by Richard Rogers. So in the heart of the city, because the East India Company was a shareholder-owned corporation, and its aim was to pursue the interests of its shareholders and its uh, management, um, and had been granted a, a charter by the Crown to trade and get access to uh, the the sort of economies of, of, of Asia from 1600. So I think that's very important. And again, I think the sort of often the story or received story, certainly here in England, is of uh, the Raj, the sort of the state-driven conquest of India. But actually, the conquest of India was led by a corporation. Um, and that led me to think about some of the characteristics of corporations as one of the most powerful institutions of our time that we need to be constantly vigilant about. Um, so what is the purpose of the corporation? How does that lead to human well-being and, and so on? How, what is the governance of the corporation? Who runs it? Are they shareholders? What, what role do other stakeholders have? What is its technology? And for the East India Company, its technology was the armed ship, was its East India man, as it was called. And, and so, I don't know, Amazon, its technology is digital. The East India Company, its technology was an armed, armed ship. Yeah. Uh, and so on and so on. And, and, and what's its financing? How does the shareholder-owned model 
how, what does that do in terms of the metabolism of the corporation? Um, and as I dug more into this company's history, I found that it had its own shareholder bubble, yeah, stock bubble, for boom and bust, which I described as the Bengal bubble. Um, and so had a lot of resonance. This obviously this thing from the 18th, 19th century, obviously very, very, very different uh, to now. Um, but it um, obviously had a lot of resonance with our issues about how to make sure that corporations are operation responsible, uh, responsibly today. So that was, for me, um, both a sort of trip back into history, um, also a way of maybe understanding India more, but gave me a structure also for how to maybe think about changing corporations today. Yeah. And from there, Nick, one of your uh, most, actually long before you wrote this book, your biggest influence on my work was your writing about uh, the combined influence or role of Hayek, Polanyi, and Karl Popper mm -hmm. in our in shaping the post war uh, post war world and therefore today's world. Uh, I'm keen to hear how you saw Polanyi's. Uh, articulation of the conquest of the market, uh, sorry, the conquest of society by the market as a mm -hmm. key turning point, because there is actually a link between that and the rise of the corporation. But uh, you have a particularly nuanced way of expressing that. So I'm very keen to uh, hear you explain how that helped shape our world today. Right. Well, maybe if I could just go a little bit about these three characters you, you described, uh, Rajani. I mean, the, these were, I call them three wise men because of the Christmas story. But essentially, here were three um, Austrians, yeah, Friedrich Hayek, Karl Popper, Karl Polanyi, who um, actually fled Austria because of the Nazi takeover. Um, and what they were trying to do in very, very different ways was explain the collapse of essentially the liberal market order in the 1920s and 30s. Um, this is the, the sort of, in a sense, a, a civilization had, had collapsed. You'd had the First World War, you'd had hyperinflation, you'd had the Great uh, Crash, the Depression, the rise, obviously, of communism and fascism. And these people fled their, ho fled their homes, their home Vienna, a huge cosmopolitan center, and tried to explain Friedrich Hayek uh, was a libertarian and became the sort of godfather of the neoliberal policies of Mrs. Thatcher and Reagan and so on. Um, uh, Karl, Karl Popper um, was a great scientific thinker and he really, really went into how the sort of the failure of Marxist thinking um, and, and particularly about the inevitability of, of sort of revolution and how that had actually... Um, uh, taken away the intellectual power of people who could have resisted Hitler, yeah? And then we have Polanyi, who is a very, very interesting uh, thinker. Um, and his book, The Great Transformation, written in the depths of the, um, the Second World War in London, um, is very interesting. I think from very, coming very much from a progressive um, background, but not from a, I would say, a Marxist background, much more, I suppose, uh, open, uh, open-minded. And he was really talking about what these sort of false, these false utopias and how the market creates uh, these commodities and commodifies things which are, are not commodities. So people, um, often in business, we call them human capital, which is actually, if you, again, if you look at behind the term, is a terrible idea. Uh, human capital only really exists where you have slavery that you have someone you own and you trade. So human capital, again, sounds like a reasonable idea, but is a terrible idea. And then obviously land as well, that is commodified. And again, now we talk often about natural capital, which in many ways is a nice reformist idea because we want to think about the stocks of nature and their flows and so on. But again, perhaps within it has a sort of a, a worm of, of which actually makes us again, commodify nature. So that's for me was, was um, Polanyi's great insight that actually many of the things in the markets um, actually create these false commodities, which, which are not um, and will not remain as commodities. People will rebel if they're treated just as human capital. 
nature will collapse if you treat it purely as natural capital. Um, and so I think his, his insights writing again from collapse, a state of collapse, a state of world war, I think have been very influential, certainly for my thinking of, again, how we sort of um, rethink the way we think of, of the market and these false commodities. The other, actually, again, the commodification of money as well. So that, in a sense, the, these ways in which things that, that are, 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 are useful, we need to think of them uh, not just as things to be bought and sold in the marketplace. Nick, I think a little bit more on the commodification of money, because that is not something that most people uh, who would be listening to this are very familiar with. So just could you elaborate a little bit on that idea of the commodification of money? Yeah, and I, I, I think particularly now, um, that is particularly important. I mean, Polanyi was writing in the 1940s. Now we're in the 21st century, and we are in this era, which is a horrible word, of financialization. Yeah, and I think that's that. That is financialization describes the, the commodification of money, where you have increasingly investment markets being driven not by actually providing capital for long-term development of businesses and small businesses and households and countries and so on, but actually really, but actually trying obviously to make money from money. And, and Keynes wrote about this in, in his very wise way in his general theory um, and, 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 and about this. But I think that is what has happened is that finance has become at the heart and that is, that is, that is fi the financial system now, rather than the financial system essentially serving the economy, which sits within societal norms and sits within nature. Now we have sort of finance extracting from the economy, depleting human, hu hum hu humanity's being and wrecking the planet. So I think that we really do need to think very much about fi finance, again, being a, a, a tool rather than a, actually the sort of the end goal. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's why uh, that we think of the macroeconomic system that has uh, been in place definitely since the Second World War. Uh, as being imbued with a form of structural violence, right? That is a term which uh, Johan Galtung has uh, made, uh, uh, well, if not popular, but at least uh, in uh, fairly wide usage. Uh, so, Nick, from your journey of being influenced by the Brundtland Report to today, and out of that, I would say at least 30 years or 25 years, you have worked directly on the efforts to make the systems of finance less violent by being more aware of their social and environmental impacts. Can you just walk us through some of the landmarks in this 25, 30 year period? For you, yeah. you know, because you have been personally right. engaged in these efforts. Right. Right, and there, there is, I mean, uh, to use the sort of uh, the term of the sort of Italian soup, there's a minestrone of different terms and ideas. So actually, it's, it's quite confusing. Um, but essentially, there have been a sort of a number of different, different ways. There's, there's ethical investment, which actually, certainly in the West, comes out of the religious tradition, particularly the Christian faith, about applying your faith principles to the way in which you manage and steward money. And that, that's particularly strong in the Christian tradition, also in the Islamic tradition. And, and I think it'd be interesting to see about how that could be applied, for example, in, Indo in, in India, by both Muslims and Christians and, and indeed Hindus. What would be an ethical form of investment for, for, for people in India, but bringing together those, those different faiths. And so that was essentially the starting point. That's the way I went into uh, the city, very small, um, but potentially quite influential, not least because the ethical investment had a, had a sense of sort of, yes, we did not want to invest in, in, in weapons and in gambling and in alcohol and tobacco and all these things. But also we sense we actually wanted to contribute to building a more sustainable economy. And because actually from the 1980s on, there was a beginnings of the sort of green economy, the sustainable development, actually markets all about anticipation. What's gonna be happening next? Who's gonna do well in the future? And so a lot of these ethical funds started actually performing very well because actually they were thinking ahead. They weren't, they weren't thinking that 
the oil industry is always going to be with us. In fact, actually, it could decline. So that's the first, the first, first phase, I think. The second is very much um, around risk, the whole notion of, of, of risk. And increasingly, so not so much my values from inside to, 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 the, to, the, to the stock market and to finance, but what is the outside world? How does the things coming from the outside world affect me in my portfolio? And I suppose, so the, the main thing there is thinking about climate change and recognizing that as we move to a clean economy, things that we currently or previously thought as valuable, like fossil fuels, will increasingly have no value. Um, and that led to um, the formation of a think tank called Carbon Tracker, which I helped to set up with my colleague, uh, Mark Campanani. And that it sort of essentially gave birth in the financial sector, this notion of stranded assets, that as we move from a um, high carbon, polluting, extractive economy to a sustainable economy, the things that we think are valuable now will potentially lose value. And actually, you could have huge stranding of fossil fuel assets. That's already happening, happened in terms of coal in Europe and North America. It's starting to happen already in India that actually uh, the, the, va the value of these, these stocks. So that, that, that was the whole notion of risk. And that was really supercharged by the global financial crisis of, of the 2008 and nine, because I think until then in this financialized world, uh, we thought the financial system sort of was perfect, that it tended towards equilibrium and it couldn't crash. It couldn't, you could have maybe a stock market crash, but the system couldn't actually potentially risk collapse. And so after that financial crisis with the rising concern about climate change, this is where the carbon bubble concept took off that actually you could have serious dislocations in the financial system by overinvestment in, in fossil fuels. So that's the, that's the risk narrative, step two. And if I may, then the yeah. third is where we are now, which is alignment um, and actually- Alignment. Alignment. How do you make okay. sure that your investments, your finance are aligned with society's goals? So not just your own personal values, but the SDGs, the Paris agreements, uh, and that's the current process uh, and, is, and is potentially gonna have very, very profound implications. Yeah. So Nick, since you have been following and been largely involved in different aspects of the environmental movement, I have one uh, kind of a challenging uh, problem uh, that I've, uh, many people have actually posed to me that at one extreme is the idea that from the time that human beings started mining cultures, Mm -hmm. When we started extracting from what was below the surface of the earth and and used that to do things which were uh, uh, going to inevitably put the biosphere out of whack or out of sync, okay, that we have been doomed. This is one extreme view. In a sense, I think maybe this would be the view of the deep ecologists. Mm -hmm. But the, the counter to this is that to be human is to be curious. To be human is to push the boundaries of what is possible today and to do something different and something more tomorrow. And so it, it, if you accept that as being fundamental to the human condition, then it was inevitable that we would figure out how to make fire. We would mm -hmm. figure out that if you get a round object, it rolls and can make a wheel and so on. You know, till we are now... Uh, about to, we are now able to leave our solar system, at least unmanned vehicles are able to leave mm -hmm. the solar system. In this larger frame, how uh, people like you fascinate me because you are working in the middle of this, this kind of mm -hmm. you know, big question. And mm -hmm. you're taking the reality as it is and trying to, um, you know, do damage control, basically. But also there is a sense of a vision. You, I've always felt that your underlying faith is that with human ingenuity and creativity, we can still reorient systems to be less violent, both to humans and to the environment. So in this larger flame of the extreme, let's say the deep ecologists on the one side and the complete cynics 
of mm. the free market on the other extreme how do you see the next say 20 30 years what is your projection where what what are, okay let's look first at what excites you what are the exciting possibilities right till 2050 right. or so uh, yeah. and then second part what are what what scares you So I think that's very interesting, Raji. I mean, in a sense, I think the the project we have is to establish a coexistence uh, whereby we recognise our place within nature. We're not separate from nature, and I think that has that's been it. obviously one of the the things that has happened, uh, particularly in the Western tradition. But I mean, so that sort of re- recognising that coexistence, our place in nature, our place actually in some ways to actually uh, enhance nature. gardens <laughs> beautiful gardens i mean this is an enhancement of nature that's not taking away uh, and, and and so on and 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 also recognizing i think particularly how we um deal with things that we don't love um because particularly in the nature in the natural world we 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 do think about sort of conservation of lions and tigers and so on which are potentially quite lovable but we also got to love the the bugs and the bees and the snakes and the insects and all the rest of it, which are fun, the fungi and all these all these things yeah and and for me to be honest that that sense of coexistence is, is is very important um i come from a country england which was had de- largely deforested by 1000 ad by by 1066 we only had 15% of our forest left we are a we are a one of the most degraded com- countries on 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 earth um and for me what interests me um is is actually that constant relationship between people and and nature and place um in, in particularly in england and and to some extent i find i mean so for for me i find things like mountains very alien because they don't they're not really about people that these hard rocky things i like pastures and fields and and hills and so on green green things where i can see where people have been before this is why india is so interesting people have been before for thousands of years that so that interaction that coexistence is for me the interesting interesting thing so that's the that in a sense is how do we express that also um economically and i think so i think there are a number of uh, a, a, a number of things one is i think uh, the thing that excites me and moves me at the moment is Uh, about uh, the just transi- transition um so as we move to the green economy how do we make sure that that actually is a tool for uh, improving the well-being particularly of the most vulnerable um so as we end coal how do we ensure let's say in india that the, the people who are living in the coal regions who probably have terrible lives mafia poor conditions air pollution how can their lives be enriched and so on so this is not just a sort of environmentalist no coal but actually is a just transition to a a greener but also a more uh yeah more fulfilling um civilizations so that's what i'm working on a lot on 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 finance and then i think there is um clearly the climate challenge which i think is we can deal with and entirely possible now we have the technologies which is which is great renewables energy efficiency electric vehicles and various others i mean hydrogen sort of hydrogen economy and and so on so so in a sense dealing with the carbon and the climate change problem in terms of reducing pollution to zero is now entirely possible whether we do it is another another matter um it's entirely possible um and i think we'll go much much quicker than we thought and and co- the covid crisis is speeding it up in many ways the shock to the oil industry um is 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 speeding it up and 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 the the thing that i've really taken away from that is that particularly for um energy importing nations britain india the shift to a net zero economy is absolutely wonderful completely wonderful yeah because we'll be using our nat- national resources to invest in our infrastructure our people our land and stop sending money fos- to fossil fuel exporting states most of whom are are deeply unpleasant in many ways so actually the net zero future is is great so just transition getting off fossil fuels which will reduce corruption in many ways and then there's this big challenge of nature how do we from an economic point of view 
how do we develop that uh, and financial point of view how do we develop that that sort of peaceful coexistence let's say peaceful coexistence between the economy and nature um and that i think is as much an intellectual issue as a practical issue is, is this i find notions of natural capital although they are promoted by many in the business community as 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 better ways of understanding stocks and flows i find them phys- philosophically very worrying because they they assume that nature is, is there as capital for our benefit and of course nature is not there for uh, just as capital nature is there for its own own reasons yeah so we've got to be able to understand its its reasons and its purpose uh, as well as th- th- what we want to sort of draw from it but nick how much of the business and finance world believes that nature is there for itself and you know from the inside and here i'd like you to bring in your experience in the work you did at the united nations environment program on creating structures for sustainable finance uh, uh, i i and and then maybe from there go to what you've been telling me that it is now the beginning of the uh, the end of the beginning but still how far have we reached in persuading sent people at the heart of you know the world global uh, leadership of finance and and commerce that yeah. nature doesn't exist for human beings i well i think two things i think climate change now um you'll be a, probably a very uh, be a very strange leader in the financial world now if you don't recognize climate change as a major major threat uh, and particularly in india which is hugely vulnerable probably the most the, the most vulnerable large nation to 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 climate change so so i think that is but that has taken 20 years to get there uh, obviously we've seen the forest fire and i think on the nature element i think there's now a recognition that actually conserving nature conserving biodiversity is important and that's because of covid because covid is a zoonotic disease zoo as in as in zoos where we go and visit animals it it transfers from a- other animals to us and one of the main drivers of zoonotic disease is deforestation climate change disruption of biodiversity so so i think the recognition people have, in many ways have been trying to put a price on nature and and sort of it's a sort of foolish quest in many ways and now we've got covid is that not a price tag big enough really is that on a big enough price tag the suffering that's been uh suffering the so i think on climate i think it's it, it's it's becoming certainly in 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 europe i would say uh, in the us perhaps as well it is becoming more more embedded people will get that it's time it's got timetables 2050 for net zero you can quantify it co2 emissions so i think it fits relatively well for the financial system who love quantification nature um much uh, much much harder i would say and i yeah. think that i would think it, there will be a period where it still is being seen in that um uh, no longer you want to move from extractive world but this sort of way of natural capital which maybe is an improvement but isn't um an end point but uh, as you suggested i think probably where we are now on finance and sustainability and sort of social justice is we have been working at people have been working at this long before me let's say for 30 years and now ESG environmental social governance is now being picked up around around the world you have new ESG funds in India uh, around, all around the world so we have got to the end, to the end of the beginning this is where it starts uh, and then we need to think about transforming the financial system uh, as a whole um yeah. and that in more profound more. ways you mean in more in profound more. ways the, the only profound. problem is that uh, uh we have a timeline that is shrinking yeah. and shrinking faster and faster if uh you know we had uh the kind of time scales on which human beings have otherwise made changes you know we are in that sense um, very profound changes have happened over centuries but over the last 200 300 years everything happens at a faster pace and in this last 20 30 years more than ever before that's one that mm-hmm. how how we and our technologies are changing things and added to that is the fact that we have crossed a threshold and now climate 
change is on an accelerating track so when you put this time urgency uh, beside the whatever the, the the satisfaction of knowing how much we have managed to move in the last 20 years then how do things look what are the prospects because uh, many of my uh, colleagues in the environmental movement are extremely pessimistic now mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. particularly after paris well i think it, i think it's I, as i as i say i think particularly um in a sense we are i mean from an economic point of view what is happening is that the climate uh, transformation is happening at the same time as digitization now we know the digitization has many perils for democracy for privacy for individual liberty and so on but it does actually go potentially hand in hand to a more smart economy so uh, particularly if you think about solar solar and digital and electric vehicles are all part of the same technology set oh. um and i think we know the cost curve in terms of renewables solar coming down the potential in india for solar uh, and so on is is absolutely uh, immense so so i think on the on the climate on the technology side uh, in terms of driving down emissions and building a clean i i mean i think that is that is now a sort of human and institutional issue the money is there the technology is there is a deployment issue and particularly uh in india a just transition issue so actually how to ensure that uh renewables are deployed in a way that doesn't take away people's land and 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 so on and so forth so i think that 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 i think um maybe after paris people i think now people are relatively quietly optimistic that it can be done whether it will be done again another uh, a, a, another 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 challenge and th- so uh, this other task then i think is then to see how we can in a sense civilize the financial system um humanize it in in a sense i mean the m- many of the people i've worked in in the financial system in banks and investors very ethical people individually very ethical actually um and and so it's that is not it's not necessarily a problem of individual ethics you have bad people in ngos you have good people in ngos you have bad people in government good people in government you have good and bad people in in the financial world as well but it's the systems and the incentives which are driving people towards that short term extraction mentality and so that's the agenda which is i think again one of the more startling things that's happened when i was working um as you know at the un we set up this very grandly titled thing and i was a co-director with a colleague called simon zedek called the inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system very very big long thing very ambitious um but that when we did work in india with um nenal kidwai and so on it was very very interesting and but that was a recognition that this question of sustainability was not just about an individual company an individual portfolio but actually was something for the system as a whole and therefore the guardians of the financial system the central banks they need to have a role and i think that's one of the more interesting uh, issues now you now have a group called the network for greening the financial system now global it's a is, global network the global network it is not set up by greenpeace it is set up <laughs> by the banque de france it has 80 members including now the federal reserve the mexican central bank the singaporean central bank the south africans the brazilians the dutch the french the germans the rbi reserve bank of india i think will be joining very soon they're already starting to incorporate climate as a risk in some of their their analysis so now i think there's a consensus that the guardians of the financial system those who are charged with stability need to think about climate change as a stability but also need to think again about how they can shape the purpose of finance how can the purpose of finance be shaped to deliver this transition that we want i think one more challenge again this will uh, i'm i'm asking you both as a historian and as a contemporary uh, person engaged uh, you know literally in the trenches of the struggle for change in some ways until so here's my proposition if we cannot delink value from money is there any hope 
Now, as a, you know, historically, that this is a very recent phenomenon in human experience. That we have reduced all value mm -hmm. to the money metric, okay, yeah. and it's become incalculably worse after the Second World War when the notion of GDP, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, became the way in which every country is expected to judge their self-esteem almost. Right. And what is the GDP? It's nothing more than the sum total of monetizable transactions. Yeah. Right. In a year. Yeah. So uh, I sometimes feel that this, uh, no, there is a recognition for this. And I know that the recognition of the need to redefine value and take it away from its uh, focus on money uh, or its exclusive connection with money is recognized. Uh, and I'm also aware that it's a very complex problem you know as george soros said to me in an interview he said you know the social and environmental lines are very important in the triple bottom line but they just don't have the simplicity of the money bottom line right when it right. comes to measuring and evaluating so i understand it's a complex problem but how do we move forward and at some level i feel we are now in the same place that we were, say, in the 1800s, where when enough people believed it was okay to treat some humans as animals and mm -hmm. buy and sell them in the same way that you buy and sell cattle or horses or uh, shoes. So uh, that, okay, I think we've moved a long way from that. You cannot mm -hmm. have slavery today, at least mm -hmm. not legally in any country of the world. Mm -hmm. So what is your projection? How will we journey on this? So I think it's really interesting and actually very timely as well, because um, in early uh, February, uh, Partha Dasgupta, an Indian economist uh, now based in the UK, released his Economics of Biodiversity, which, which did touch on these things. Uh, and, and I think he makes a, a good point. I mean, GDP is a very useful tool for me measuring the flow of money around the economy. Useful thing, but it's completely ill-suited to try and understand human well-being or indeed um, our sustainability in terms of uh, resources and, and the way we, we treat nature, because these things aren't included. In fact, they may well be included in perverse ways. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's for me, is clear. I, I think where I, I think one of the dangers, particularly on the question about sort of economics and nature, is to try and monetize nature. Because I think these are only ever going to be estimates and only going to be calculations. They're not real. They're not, they're not real in a sense. So for me, there was an interesting uh, report uh, done uh, for the French government looking at uh, new measures of, of, of prosperity and so on. And it had the image, image of a dashboard. So if you manage an old petroleum car, obviously the, the, the petroleum vehicle of, the, 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 of which is now going out of fashion, you would have a whole series of measures. You'd have a speedometer, you'd have a fuel tank, you would have a water, water gauge and so on. And so we, we need to measure those separately. And rather than averaging them, you don't want to average your speed and your fuel tank, tank gauge. That, lead, that will lead you to completely garbage data. So we don't necessarily want, want to actually, we have a monetary measure for things that are monetizable, fine. And then we have indicators which are about human well-being, which we have, and then indicators about the well-being of nature, which we have, but we don't try and blend them. We actually have to be smart enough to recognize that we need to be thinking about sort of what people call multi-criteria analysis, yeah. be able to think about these things together uh, but we don't try and blend them because then we'll get garbage. Um, and so I think, yes, we need to recognize nature. But I, I, am, uh, I think obviously you can improve the way that people use nature by maybe using taxation. Yeah. Or, or carbon, a car price on carbon is a good thing. But that is a, a price on carbon is a very different thing from valuing carbon. Yeah? yeah. It's a tool. It's only a tool. We're not trying to say this is what it's worth. Well, this is what its damage function is. I think these sort of um, monetizations of nature are, are intellectually fascinating, but actually I think philosophically quite dangerous.
yeah and they don't they don't inherently or even necessarily move us to less violent systems they actually and this is what has happened so far uh, they just moved the deck chairs on the titanic right yes I, no, exactly and and so i think i mean i think one of the real um i think as i say we can we we have the entire potential now to reduce our carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 as we need it and i think we could do that in a just way possible yeah we yeah. do it to us nature however conserving biodiversity and conserving biodiversity in a way that is not just for our immediate interests i think is really hard i can't see it happening myself um because i think it it's touch it, it it touches on i don't see the same technological revolution that led to renewables and and so on we have biotechnology which again can be quite extractive and it does perhaps lead also it leads to we have to have a huge sense of imagination most of the world now is in cities how do we imagine this thing called nature where actually nature is now maybe just a pigeon yeah, yeah. so i think it's increasingly hard for people to actually concept it's really think about this thing called 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 nature because now it's increasingly distant for most people on the planet yeah that's why you have just repeat that for me tactical optimism and strategic despair that's right yeah well exactly so that's how i see it that actually there's lots of great stuff going on i mean yeah. i think and again lots of progress and so on yeah but i think in terms of this despair i think the particularly the sort of the the abundance of nature I see that as being quite hard. I think it's great it's now on the agenda like climate change was put on the agenda for economics and finance 20 years ago. Um but I think it's it's hard. One thing and again this is where uh Gandhi and in India has a lot to offer is in diet. Because we know the major driver for the destruction of nature is diet, particularly a meat-based diet and in some cases also a dairy-based diet as well. Uh, so a, a diet that is excessively based on meat and dairy is one of the main drivers of um deforestation land use change huge, as we know huge amounts of agricultural produce is not fed to people but is fed to animals to turn into meat and dairy for people so yeah. that is maybe again something that uh india is is it ha- has at least a very strong it's a civilization in one sense that is based on a vegetarian diet um and and someone said something to me which i think is very profound about india's the importance of india now in this shift um as we know india is very vulnerable um land use very small for a big and rising population water very scarce soil uh, eroding rapidly climate change impacting etc cetera, etc cetera. so the na- natural base is very 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 uh, very vulnerable but if we think about sort of the global situation and the millennium development goals which were set by the un those were delivered essentially by china the poverty was reduced globally on average because of china's success admittedly at huge cost to the environment the sustainable development goals by 2030 will only be delivered if india delivers them yeah india with its huge population huge poverty for 500 million people maybe more so india is actually glo- absolutely globally central to this task of delivering sustainable development caring for biodiversity dealing with climate change uh, rising raising up the living standards and the dignity of of people it's not it's not a sort of it's not a side show it is perhaps the most important country for the next decade yeah so in closing uh, nick you you mentioned in passing that so many exciting things are happening i think one of those is that we have now a generation Uh, of people who are entering uh, the workforce say people who are in their 20s or early 30s who i think are more oriented to the thinking that is required in the 20 they have they've been born into it they don't have mm-hmm. to unlearn as much as even our generation had to so right. in closing what are some of what's what advice would you give to them you know i mean uh, in terms of where to focus their energies and what are some of the uh, 
the drivers of creativity that that inspire you that which, which could inspire them to make well, a non violent economy yeah i mean i can maybe i just talk about my my children i have three three children uh, two boys and a girl and i think what is really interesting as you say is that uh, issues around climate change and sustainability are instinctive for them whether they practice it, it it is part of their their life through school and so on i was never taught anything about the environment at all at school or university nothing um so i think i think that's that that's that's a good thing i, I also sense actually that is a generation that is very concerned with health which my generation wasn't um certainly actually they're much fitter exercise and so on and health in the broad sense of of well-being and also diets they're fantastically interested in 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 diet and and change and interesting foods and 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 also more vegan foods as well so i think that's really 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 interesting as we know that changing diet is as important as driving down fossil fuels these two things are are fundamentally important so that that's um that's really good and i think also there is an instinctive respect for people the rights issues about sort of uh, gender injustice and racial injustice and so on these are things which are just incomprehensible actually yeah. i think yeah incomprehensible why should you there is no basis for discrimination on race or gender in any form whatsoever and those i think and those are natural so i think those three things are sort of the fact that they're natural and therefore my encouragement would be to continue that yeah could yeah. to sort of continue with that sense that these these rights and um the uh sort of understanding the dignity of other people and the dignity of the planet are are natural things yeah that's great i think thank you so much